Yeah, Umberto, uh, I'm sure you have observed, like me, that suddenly in scientific literature appears papers which show that scientists themselves are not quite sure of what they are doing. So there are scientists who write about what are we doing, what is science all about. Apparently there are particular positions which do not share the orthodox view of science. And uh, if I understand the orthodox view, <laughs> what they do, they postulate at first a universe, a cosmos, a world, that which is outside of oneself, independent of the observer. Yes, that is how I studied when I studied to become a scientist. Yeah. To yeah. do science, you had to assume that there was an independent university. Universe, yeah. university, I mean, I was in the university. Independent universe, and that this somehow could be known. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so far as I remember all your, your earlier position, there is no need to make that stipulation. Exactly. One could do lots of lovely science without that particular stipulation as an independent universe. Not only lot, all science. Ah, all science, yeah. Yeah. No, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Another point I remember uh, you made at earlier times is if you make research with particular tools of approach how to find out what that universe is supposed to be, the form of inquiry will influence the form of the answer you are going to get. Yes. Uh, I've tried to find a, some parallel so that it's easily understood. I see, for instance, the point of a question. A question can many, many different answers. The question is, in which context is the question being asked? For instance, if I ask, what is consciousness? I say, well, what is it? In what context? If you have the context of a linguist, you may say, uh-huh, Consciousness is a combination of two words, the one is con, the other one is science. That means knowing together is consciousness. So my asker may say, but look, that doesn't tell me anything what consciousness is. Aha, no, why don't you look up the lexicon, look up the dictionary. So he looks up the dictionary, there it says, consciousness being an awareness of being in the universe with other people and yourself, awareness, blah, blah, blah. There were lots of stories about what the uh, dictionary would say. He said, but that doesn't tell me what the consciousness is. So, okay, in which way would you have, what context would you like to have? So he would say, I would understand the neurology of con consciousness. Then I would say, go to Umberto Maturana, he will tell you exactly <laughs> what consciousness is. I mean, I just yes, give yes, a, yes, yes. a comparison of the notion that the question alone is not enough to determine what the answer is supposed to be. And the form of the question, or the form of research, may already influence the form of the answer you get. Therefore, if you search about the structure or the nature of the universe, the way you ask that question may influence the way the answer of the universe is coming back. Therefore, to talk about an independent universe sitting there is hopeless, because everybody will come with a different answer, yes. depending on the way how he asked the question. Yeah. And besides, when you ask the question, for example, what is consciousness, you are already answering the question by claiming that consciousness is there already when you ask about it. Yeah, yeah. And so you are not asking a question in a way in which you could show how this, that you call consciousness, yeah. arises, so that you indeed are talking about that which you distinguish not about something that you presuppose already at the beginning. No, but if I were to ask, is there consciousness? That could be, or what do I distinguish when I distinguish oh, that consciousness? that means you put it back to the question. Right? Exactly. Very good point, yeah, yeah. very good point. Yeah. yeah. And if one does that, then of course you open space in order to do something in relation to the daily experience in which we speak as if consciousness were there. Yeah. Although yeah. we have no idea of what we are talking about. Exactly. But, but only what we do together, when we talk about yeah, yes, about and that so, we have idea. So to say, the answer will only then formulate what consciousness it was supposed to meant, be meant. Yes. In the question. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, okay. What I see in science, or parallel to science, there are many different approaches to ask that question: What is the universe? What mm -hmm. is the world? What kind of a thing are we studying here? And one of the most orthodox one, very well known, is of course the approach of scientists. Science is a fabulous 
approach to get closer to what the university is. Now, as you remember, I always like to look up where do words come from? Mm -hmm. What are the composition of words? What are the roots of words? So I found when I looked up in an original word dictionary, what is the origin of science? It comes from an Indo-European syllable, which is ski or sky. And I ask myself, what is ski and sky? No, it fortunately explains. It is a notion of separating, distinguishing, mm -hmm. taking it apart. Mm -hmm. So out of this ski are emerging several other words, like schizophrenia, mm -hmm. like schism, mm -hmm. and funnily enough, science. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the most funny of all is shit is coming from that, because this is what you would like to separate yourself mm -hmm. from. <laughs> yeah. So we have then these various notions of regarding science as a separating effort. I ask myself, what are the complementary activity to ah. separate, to distinguish, to put apart? Ah. And this is, of course, to unify, to yes. put things together, uh -huh. uh, to identify and not to distinguish. Now, what are the Greek or the other Indo-European root words for this activity? They are, the Greek word for one is hen, and out of that word comes syn, like in symphony, mm -hmm. or synthesis, or synergy, all these words with syn, and of course some other ones is uh, system, putting things together. Mm -hmm. So I have these two major approaches how to look at the question. The one is taking things apart, and then you are a scientist. Mm -hmm. The other one is trying to integrate things. This is when you are a systemicist, so mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. somebody who is following the idea of systemics. Mm -hmm. Now, if you make that distinction, you speak as a scientist who makes distinction. If you see the complementarity between the two, then you are a systemicist because you see the complementarity of the two activities approaching the question. Is mm -hmm. what yeah, of yeah, really. Yes, of course. Of course, one looks now, I look for examples of, of people who were presenting the notion of systemics. And one of the most impressive men of today, so, uh, uh, this particular century, was Gregory Bateson. You remember, Gregory yeah. always trying to see connections and relations and patterns. He had this wonderful phrase, the pattern which connects. Mm -hmm. And when he wrote this wonderful book on mind and nature, a necessary unity. He wrote already in the preface, I would like to propose another title for that book, which could be taken in exchange. And this is the pattern which connects. I thought it was a very charming gesture to draw our attention to relations and not to separations. Yeah. And the difficulty for us is that in order to talk about something, yeah. we must make the something we talk about by separating it. Yeah. So we could even have a scientific approach to system, yeah. to, the, to the whole that we are yeah. distinguishing. And our problem is to see how this whole is constituted such that we can treat this as a separate thing as we do science to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is this lovely phrase from Bateson, also, unfortunately I should know it by heart, I only can approximately repeat it. He says, he asks himself, what is the relation between the crab and the lobster? What are the relations of the crab and the lobster to the frog? Mm -hmm. What is the relation of these three to me? And what is our three relation to you? Mm -hmm. So immediately drawing, the point of not looking at the crab alone, not looking at the frog alone, not at you alone, but in the context of all these living creatures, which somehow are united by their livingness, or something like that. So indeed, what he is pointing to is that, as we do attempt to understand or to explain something, we have to operate with this separation, and then with the putting together by looking at the relations through which the togetherness yeah. arises yeah. and how this togetherness uh, is constituted in a network of relations, yeah. making this totality that is the system. Yeah. Yeah. So the pattern, uh, the pattern that connects, yeah. the, the network of connections. 
when I heard this Beethovenian pattern, I, did, I was very touched, but I thought pattern comes from pater, the father, mm -hmm. yeah? which is, so to say, the same thing when you have a stamp, mm -hmm. then the papa is making again and again children of himself. Mm -hmm. But of course, this is a paternalistic way of looking at the universe. I'm, I'm, you know, I prefer very much to look at women. Yes. So I thought, what is a complementary to pattern? Uh -huh, it's a matrix. Right. Yeah. So I thought, don't only look at the pattern which connects, look at the matrix which embeds. Yes. So everything is sitting in one big thing embedded in a matrix. And then you can make the distinction between the patterns which connect within that universe. So what is required is a three-fold look. That's right. The look that separates elements, mm -hmm. the look that sees to the connections in terms of relations that also are separated, and the look that sees the connectedness of all yeah. as a matrix in which the different elements, are either embedded. A, a, parts or relations, are embedded by constituting it. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, that's elegant. Yeah, I <laughs> thought maybe you would like that proposition. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. But the interesting thing is, uh, I think the notion of systemics, seeing things together, is, of course, much older than science, is my feeling. I think original thinkers I would suspect so, were doing yes. that. But, of course, at that time, they didn't call it systemics. I think they called it magic. 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 Yes. I think because magic is the art of dealing with things you don't understand. Yes, by grasping coherences which allow you to deal with them even without understanding exactly, them. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So yeah. I think the predecessor of science is systemics alias magic. Magic. But at the same time, yeah. the most uh, unknowable in, in these times we are, we are talking yeah. about is the source, is the matter. In fact, is the matrix itself. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? yeah. Because brings forth things which you find yourself with them without knowing how indeed they come about. Or you can say, well, it's coming up from yeah. the from the belly of the of the mother. But how? I mean, this yeah. Is but the, how the did detail. this motherness disappear? How did it happen? Well, I, I myself think that it disappeared with the origin of patriarchality, in which the emphasis was put on separation and control. Hmm. When do you think, I mean, from the his, uh, history of, of human beings, it must be very early. I think it's very, I mean, yeah. very early near us. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I think it is, must be around 10,000 years ago, yeah, not yeah. much more. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I myself also think that the history of humanity is much, much, much older. Yeah. I, I think that if we imagine all the or think about all the changes that the nervous system should have undergone yeah. from our ancestors to be as it is now, a nervous system through which languaging, distinctions, and all we do yeah. takes place, this must be many, 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 many generations. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. think that it, it is um, at least three million years ago yeah. uh -huh. that That's this must have begun. Yeah. And the state in which this could begin began still earlier, some six million years ago, yeah. when certain conditions were created such that uh, the, uh, the lineage that gave origin of us to us was possible. And then, in the middle of this history, three million years ago, the conditions of living changed such that languaging and living in language could take place. But Must be very old. What do you think very language old. is very old? Oh, yes, at least three very million old. years. Yeah, 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 at yeah. the very least, if not more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but of course, being transformed and enriched, and the whole uh, ana anatomy, structure, physiology changing in the conservation of this living in language. Yeah. And this must have been in a matrix, yeah. not in, in the, the not connected of, of, exactly. of, of patterns. I think I'm yes. glad to see it that way. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. I'm fascinated in my youth, which was a very long time, almost a century ago. Man was a very young thing. One started usually the Egyptians and the Babylonians were the first people with yeah. whom you could really take and talk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the older I got, the older human beings got. Yeah, They were pushed back to the Stone Age, to the pre-Stone Age, etc., etc. Older and older and older. Now it's going back to the millions of yes. years. Yes. 
I think this is a fascinating process yeah. to recognize that our ancestors are not from yesterday. Yes. They are pretty old guys. Yeah. yeah. And must be pretty old because this um, coherence between yeah. the manner of living yeah. and this, our body structure, our yeah. brain, mm -hmm. because our brain is, funnily enough, a languaging brain. Not that we generate language by itself, alone, yeah. but if in a domain of languaging, then languaging is learned uh, and practiced. Or invented. In, invented. Or invented, yeah, invented by the child living exactly. together with the parents yeah. easily. I mean, immediately, in, in yeah. a few months, it's already grasping the coherence yeah, of yeah. this and doing so. If you looked at studies with chimpanzees, there many American researchers who wanted to find out whether you can talk with chimps. Mm -hmm. There were the sign language people who taught chimpanzees American sign language. There were people who were teaching chimpanzees use typewriters with special symbols, mm -hmm. etc., etc. There are many very amusing stories coming from these studies. Yeah. But one of the difficulties with chimpanzees and language is that they do not enjoy languaging as we do. Aha. Uh -huh. And what way would you say is the distinction? It is that, um, of course, they would be capable of participating with you in some uh, yeah. languaging, provided that you generate a space of things that interest them. Yeah. What interests them? For example, They're playing, <laughs> huh? food, yeah. manipulating certain things. But we enjoy languaging. Here we are talking yeah. and enjoying talking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is children begin to talk and easily exactly. enjoying talking. So to talking for us is, yeah. is our manner of living and a manner of enjoying our yeah. living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not for chimpanzees. Yeah. And uh, since this, this pleasure is not there in them, I think it is because the history is not associated with language. Yeah. And in us, our history, evolutionary history, is associated with language for several I millions of years. I do not quite years. understand that, uh, this distinction. Uh, the distinction is that um, in the history, in the evolutionary history, is the, observed or is taking place? Us propose as an explanation that oh, I in see, terms yeah. of what should have taken yeah. place. Hmm? Because yeah. we, we don't have the span of observation. Yeah, yeah. But as, as we un understand how this must take place, what we can see that must have happened is that the organism and the medium change together Mm -hmm. in a way in which the organism is being transformed according to the way of living yeah. in, in relation to the medium. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. as a particular manner of living is conserved, the whole organism and medium are changing together. I see, yeah, yeah, okay, clear. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have now a body, a brain, the whole structure of our body and our yeah. physiology as which certain has the characteristics it, they have as a result of a history of being in language. Exactly. exactly and in, yeah. our, the domain which mm -hmm. we, we exist has been changing also in that history. So this is why we fit so well precisely, precisely, with languaging yeah. I see, and yeah, we enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But chimpanzees do not have that history. Yeah. So they can learn certain things. They have uh, brain abilities that allow that. But at the same time, the conservation of that is, is, is weak. You, you yeah, must yeah. be creating artificial conditions for them to live such that they will conserve yeah. it. There are, of course, many delightful examples in these studies of people working with chimpanzees. And from Glasserfield, who worked with one of the chimps by the name of Lucy, they interacted with Lucy with a typewriter. But Lucy had a typewriter with symbols on it, and they could say what she wants, food or a hug or yeah. this or that. And students were, of course, working in this lab. And there was a rule when Lutz, Lucy and the teachers outside or the students were working with each other, there was a perpetual tape of the interaction coming out from one of those typewriters. Yeah? Uh -huh. And the rule was when the conversation was ended, the tape was being cut and stored in a book. Yeah. So this student was not familiar yet with the organization of the lab. The whole thing was over, but he knew he had to cut the tape now. Yeah didn't see where are the scissors. Yeah. So Lana told him where to find the scissors. So he uh -huh, it's in this drawer of that drawer chest. He went there, took out the scissors, and could cut the tape. And, and von Glasersfeld thought, this is a tremendous success.
Yeah. That the monkey is telling other students where to find the things he needs. Yeah. But you see, there the joy of the chimpanzee is participating in manipulation. Yeah. Now, yeah. as long as you participate in manipulation, maybe this languaging yeah, yeah, can be concerned. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But we enjoy languaging itself. Yeah. yeah. But I think there are so fascinating experiments to establish the intelligence of, of animals. I think the most beautiful thing is the Pavlov studies to getting the conditioned reflexing going. Yeah? He had a dog, putting a dog on a, on a, on a table, and there was an assistant in a white coat. The assistant showed the dog a piece of meat, and when the dog looked at it, of course, he was looking forward, he salivated a lot of saliva was coming up, and then the assistant rang a bell. Okay, very good, they do this 10 times, and then the assistant enters the room, rings the bell, and the dog salivates. This was for dog, the proof of conditional reflex. The dog can transfer the ringing of the bell to, sh to the meat without being even shown the meat, an uh, act of symbolization. Mm -hmm. And of course, he got for that the Nobel Prize. A Polish experimental psychologist said Pavlov, wrote his experimental conditions so well in his lab books that I can repeat his experiments exactly as he carried it out. So Konoski did exactly the experiment, uh, the lab assistant with the same white coat, the dog at the, at the, at the table next to the window, a, a bell standing next to the table, assistant going with the meat, with the bell, meat and bell, and now comes the experimentum crucis where no meat is shown, but only the bell is around. Konorski took the clapper out of the bell without the assistant knowing that. So assistant goes in, grabs the bell, no sound is coming out, but the dog salivates. So Konorski concluded the ringing of the bell was a stimulus for Pavlov. <laughs> not for the dog. Not for the dog. But unfortunately, he didn't get the Nobel Prize for that. No, uh, but was a bit no because Pablo was not a very good dog. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but this brings us no, back... I'm just pointing that out, what mistake an observer can make if he yeah. takes a stimulus for something which is for him. Yes, but this brings us back to the systemic situation. Oh, yeah, yeah. You see, because this dog and the trainer yeah. and the bell and all form part of a systemic exactly, situation. Exactly, yeah. A matrix, a, a network of connections. Precisely. And so it was not a single thing yeah. who it was participating. It was the whole network of conditions yeah. that was being transformed such yeah. that the dog learned yeah. to operate in that network of connect connections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is in fact what uh, Kornowski shows, although yeah. he did not reflect in that direction. Exactly. But it's interesting yeah. that yeah. this little story no. has brought us back to our... You, you, you even remember that. You, you oh, were yes. at that conference, we reported Yes, that. yes, yes, I yeah. was at that conference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I did not think then that what this was showing was the systemic connectedness yeah. in which yeah. the dog yeah. Yeah. was found. Yeah. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. beautiful that you tell it, and this brings us back to what yeah. we were yeah. talking Wonderful. in this conversation. And this brings us back, I think, about 32 years ago, to the year 1962. Yes. To Leiden. Yes. Uh, where the big conference on information processing on the nervous system was established. That's it, yeah. You remember there was Mr. Gerard, who was the organizer of the yes. conference. Yes, yes. And he kindly invited most of the conferees to come two days earlier. The conference was supposed to start on Monday, and we were already invited on Saturday. And Saturday was a greeting morning, and he was there, everybody was coming, and Mr. Gerard said, ladies and gentlemen, I invited you two days earlier, because we will have today and tomorrow a dress rehearsal of our papers. Everybody will prepare, uh, present his paper, will accept criticism of his colleagues, and on Monday he will prepare the proper criticized paper. While I was sitting there, I thought, this is utter nonsense. I'm not going to participate in that. Particular Leiden is very close to Schäbening, one of the most beautiful North Sea bars, where fabulous beaches and so on and so forth. I'm not participating. I'm sneaking out of that gigantic conference room, 
sneaking to the door, closing it carefully so that nobody hears that I'm closing the door. You know what happens? Yeah. At the very other end, I see a man coming out of that room, carefully closing the door behind him. And I approach this gentleman and say, are you interested in following this idiotic proposition, having a dress ahead of our conference? Or would you like to go with me to Amsterdam, going to Rijks Museum, or having a very good Reistafel? The gentleman said, absolutely, I would like to do that. I introduced myself, I'm Hans von Förster. And the gentleman introduced himself, I'm Umberto Maturana. This is fantastic, you see? And we, here we are again introducing I'm ourselves into this together. systemic Wonderful. conversation. Good.